Hello, welcome to the Saving with Steve show where we talk about the ins and outs of money. Pretty much everything under the sun relates to you having a happier, healthier relationship with money. My name is Steve Sexton. I want to thank you for joining us today. You know what? A lot of stuff going on. We keep expanding our listeners throughout the United States as well as internationally. So we appreciate you all for sharing this with your friends and family and associates. By the way, we've had a lot of people go to viewers at savingwithsteve.us and say, I'd like to hear about this. In fact, this week, that's one of those. We have Steve Severade. He's the CEO of Greenspan Company, Adjusters International. He's going to be talking about the wildfires. You know, you know, we're in that extreme wildfire season and homeowners are at risk. They're worried about how they can build their lives if a disaster strikes, whether insurance will provide enough funds. He's going to walk you through it. and He's going to talk to you about what a public adjuster does. And these are things you're going to need to know because it'll make a difference in your life. Have we seen recently in the last couple of weeks, couple of months, the wildfires, disasters are really hitting everybody. So it's important to understand that. Now, last week, we have Steve Slav that educated us uh, on how seniors could use the equity in their home to create income, cover long-term care costs in retirement and more. Steve covered all the ins and outs you need to know about reverse mortgages. He, you know what? He, all you need to do if you want to go see, because you haven't, Go to savingwithsteve.us and check out episode number 79. Again, that's episode 79. And all you got to do is go to savingwithsteve.us to check it out. Now, before we jump in with Steve Severate and talk about wildfires, what I'd like to do is educate you. And what I'm talking about today is the ugly truth about retirement. See, many people wind up financially stressed during their senior years for one big reason. They don't learn the truth about retirement until it's too late. It's easy to think of retirement as the rosy, carefree period of life, but the reality is that many seniors struggle financially throughout it. As a result, you're better off getting, to lay, uh, getting the load on on retirement, even if it's hard to hear, okay, even if it's hard to hear, <clears throat> Even if it's hard to hear, <clears throat> even if it's hard to hear. So first of all, according to the Social Security Administration, 37% of every single retiree's income is made up of Social Security. The rest is made up of personal savings. Many people have the misconception about Social Security, and that's going to pay seniors enough to replace their entire paycheck in full. In reality, it's not even close. If, you're, if your average earner the benefits will only price anywhere from 37 to 40% of your pre-retirement income. Most seniors need roughly twice that much to maintain a comfortable standard of living. So if you're aiming to retire solely on Social Security with no other income sources, you're going to need to think again. In fact, a good bet is to steadily fund a retirement savings plan throughout your working years so you have the option to take withdrawals from it when you're a senior. If it's too late for that, uh, you know, you're only a few years away from retirement with limited time to catch up on savings and you're going to need another plan that could involve working part time, renting out your house. Many people in the state of California and other states have sold, took the proceeds, bought a house for cash and used the rest to invest in order to have the retirement. So if you want to be in a situation where you don't have much adjustment, make sure you start savings and make sure you talk to a financial professional to help you get through it. Number two, healthcare is going to be a burden. Many people soon, once they get into Medicare, they'll need to spend little or nothing on Medicare expenses or healthcare expenses. Not so. Medicare itself isn't even free. Part B, which covers outpatient care, charges a monthly premium that typically goes up annually. You also need Part D to cover your prescriptions. You know what? And you're going to pay a premium for that as well. On top of that, you'll be on the hook of co for co-pays, deductibles once you're on Medicare. And because there's services that Medicare doesn't cover at all, there are things you're gonna to need to pay for completely out of pocket, like dental, vision, and other things. All told, the average 65 year old retiring this year will spend about $143,000 on healthcare throughout the retirement. Average female, $157. Best way to pump up your savings to cover these is if you're eligible to participate in a health savings account or an ASSA account, 
figure out how to max them out. You can carry these money forward into retirement and use it when healthcare becomes a notable strain on your limited resource. Next, think of that long-term care cost because it's not covered by Medicare. 70% of people over the age of 65 will need some sort of help with their long-term care. Average cost for long-term care is 105,000 nationally. Here in a state like California, it's 117,000. Average stay is three years. So you could look at that saying, hey, that's a $300,000 bill. How do I handle that? Well, you can insure it. You can find a way to plan for it. So if you got time, start talking to a financial professional to find the best way to plan for long-term care or those health cares that your Medicare doesn't cover. Hey, you know what? Let's talk taxes. Your tax burden may be lowering in retirement than it is during your working year, but don't be fooled into thinking you won't be paying taxes at all. That's not the case. Unless your, your whole house of savings is actually a Roth IRA where all the proceeds of the distributions are tax-free, okay? You know what? Basically, you're going to be looking at ways to reduce your taxes. Now, look, so let's be really candid here. Most people that I've surveyed, and every time I've done the survey, most people, I'm talking 90%, feel that taxes are going to get increased sometime over the next five to 10 years. If you feel that way, it's important that you sit down with your financial advisor and your CPA to find ways to lower or eliminate your taxes. If you've got a few years before you retire, it'd be a great time to take a look at that. Quick example, I met with a couple 15 years ago. We helped them strategically and tactically convert their IRA to a Roth. And after that, I talked about tax reduction, but they didn't want anything to do with it. And they're comfortable where they're at. And that's fine. I give advice. People don't have to take it. But a couple of years ago, they came in and you know what? They wanted to fund their granddaughter's 529 program. And you know what? They were concerned about the impact it have on their retirement funds. Uh, so what we ended up doing is see, they're in a 22% tax bracket. And they had investments that created interest income, capital gain income, and social security income. Well, we took the investments that created the interest income and put it in a tax deferred account. So that would grow just like it was before. But if they didn't take out any money, they didn't have to pay any taxes. We replaced that interest income with income from the Roth IRA, which was tax free. So their tax bracket went from a 22% tax bracket down to 12. When you're in a 12% tax bracket, your dividends and capital gains are tax free. So the only thing that's going to be taxed for them is their Social Security minus their standard deductions. Taxes went from about $4,850 down to 25 bucks a year. They realized three things. One, you know what? Regardless of whatever happens legislatively, it's not likely going to affect them tax-wise. Two, they don't have to chase the streets to get returns in order to fund their granddaughter's 529 program. And number three, the most important thing to them is the ability to comfortably fund that 529 program for those kids for that grandkid. So you know what? There's three things that are going to draw down your retirement funds. they are fees that you pay on your investments. they are taxes that you're going to pay and volatility. It's important to address all three because if you do and you reduce those fees, reduce those taxes and that volatility, you'll have more money. And that's more money that you can redirect to the things that are important to you in retirement. So with that, you know what? This ends the first segment here. I want to take a quick break and we'll be right back with some Steve Severate, okay? Okay, Cameron, we just finished the intro in segment one and we're going to uh, stop the recording here or pause. Cameron, we're moving into segment one. I mean, segment, uh, segment one with Steve Severate and here we go. So, hey, welcome back to the Saving with Steve show where we talk about the ins and outs of money. If you'd like to follow us, you can always go to Google Play, YouTube, and Spotify, and you can take a look at that. Or if you'd like, you can go to the savingwithsteve.us and look at all 80 episodes. Isn't that it? something else? We're up to 80 episodes. Pretty soon we'll be up to 100. It's kind of crazy. And our listeners and viewers keep growing. So I appreciate y'all for that. So let me fill you in on Steve Severing. Steve's got 30 years of experience as a licensed professional public adjuster. He works and advocates for individuals, communities, businesses that have suffered major losses. His work has earned him a reputation as a respected industry expert, as handling a, uh, handling a broad range of residential commercial losses ranging from flyers, floods, earthquake, vandalism, tsunamis, ca catastrophic event. His team includes uh, uh, um, structural engineers, inventory specialists, forensic accountants, insurance attorneys, former claims adjusters, 
And it's all designed to secure the most favorable outcome for every property insurance claim. You know, he's represented victims across the globe in the U.S. We got Thailand, Caribbean, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, the whole shot. Um, you know what, Steve, I want to welcome you back to the show by popular demand. <laughs> Great. Thanks for having me back, Steve. I appreciate it. Hey, you know what, before we just jump into everything and start talking about regulations and all that stuff, um, could you just explain to everybody what a public adjuster does, uh, you know, what they do, how do people engage them, things like that, just so everybody can have a foundation because, you know what, a lot of people request you to come back because they want to know what to do, but you know what, I have a feeling this time around, they're going to need you. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, um, you know, we're I've been doing this, as you said, for 35 years or so, and uh, there's there's a lot of people have never even heard of what we do, even though we're licensed by various department of, uh, departments of insurance across the country. Uh, most people have never heard of a public adjuster, and so it's it's about getting out there and more public awareness, so people know that they have an opportunity and the right uh, to be able to get their own claims team. So essentially, Steve, there are three types of adjusters. There's uh, salaried adjusters. They work for the insurance company. They're on a salary and they're employees of the insurance company. They don't require any kind of license or any kind of special training necessarily. The second type of adjuster is called an independent adjuster. And that's really kind of a misnomer because they're not independent at all. They work for the interest of the insurance company. So they come out and say, I'm your adjuster, but really they're the insurance company's adjuster looking out for the insurance company to make sure that they don't pay anything more than they're absolutely convinced that they owe. The third type of adjuster is, is what, what I do and what my company Greenspan does, and that's called a public adjuster. By the way, the independent adjusters have some licensing requirements for managers, but not necessarily everybody you meet that comes out will need a license. With public adjusters, we have to be licensed both as a company and also individually licensed by the Department of Insurance to represent exclusively the policyholder, never the insurance company. So just as an independent adjuster would never get hired by a consumer or a policyholder, uh, same goes with us. We'd never get hired by an insurance company to represent their interests. So if you can liken it a little bit to like, if you were gonna purchase a property, you have the buyer's real estate agent, you have the seller's real estate agent. And everybody understands that it makes a lot of sense because uh, although they represent their, their interests. They're there together, working together to try to get the, the property transaction taken care of. And, and that's sort of how it works for us, Steve, is, is we're out there representing the policyholder. As you mentioned, we have all the various experts under our roof to help prosecute the claim and make sure it goes the best way possible and deal with the insurance company and their adjusters to get a successful outcome so that people can move on with their lives and, and make sure that they're compensated fairly and didn't leave anything uh, on the table. You know what, just to, uh, to make it real simple, basically you have the adjusters who work for the insurance companies and the independent adjusters that work for the insurance companies or, or they're contracted to work for the insurance companies. And basically those people are following the limits and guidelines that the insurance companies provide and say, here's our limit for this type of claim. So that's, you know, what we're going to pay out. And this is what you need to focus on achieving. Is that correct? Yeah. Also, I think it's important to note, you know, I'm, I'm not out here bashing insurance companies. The way the policies are written and constructed, if you read the contract, and that's what it is, it's a contract, the, you, the policyholder, the homeowner, the business owner, have certain duties you need to fulfill under the terms of that contract. It's not the insurance company's duty to, uh, to, to put the inventory together, to prepare the claim, to present the claim. Those are all the policyholder's duties. So, if you don't get it right, and if you've never done this before, and you've got all these experts on the other side who have no fiduciary obligation for you to get it right, uh, how do you know the best way to do it? How do you interpret the terms and the language of the policy if you don't have history and, and knowledge of how to do it? So you're really at a disadvantage, not necessarily the insurance company's fault, right? Because they're your duties. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I could see that, especially if somebody has a fire like we saw um, just going up the hill in Orange County, California, where these you know, multi-million dollar homes just were, um, dev or I want to say devastated, so to speak. That's probably not the right word, but they were just gone. And, um, you know, there's people there that had collections 
um, that have completely burned up. And if they don't have the proper documentation according to their plan, they really not gonna get much for that. Um, and that, and that's, 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 a, that's a sad situation, especially you can lose something that you really work for a lifetime and it's gone because you didn't know how to properly um, document it, so to speak. Sure, so, sure. So that's, that's really important. Now, uh, let's, let's talk about, you know, California has new insurance regulations, you know, and what does it really mean to property owners? Well, some of these things are, are, are great. The great new legislations come in uh, and it's given, it's, it's, done, it's gone a long ways from the old days of uh, doing this where the insurance companies kind of could just do whatever they wanted. A lot more guidelines and built into the cake now, there's some, some benefits that insureds have now that they didn't have before. I think one of the most significant ones, Steve, is uh, it used to be, you could always, instead of rebuilding your home at the location, you could always have the opportunity to use your replacement cost benefits and qualify under your insurance to buy another house. So if you just didn't wanna take the time it takes to build a house, or if you just wanted to move somewhere, you could get your replacement cost benefits by purchasing another home, but that, that was normal, that's not new. But what is new, and this is really significant, is that you used to have to take the land out of the new house out of the equation. And, and, and really that's the fair way to do it. So if you had a house that burned down, and you had a replacement cost agreement where you have to spend the money in order to get all of the money. That's how it works. Uh, and you didn't want to take the time and the energy to rebuild there. You could go buy another house. You'd still own the land where, your, where the fire was at your home. You still own that land. And so they would, insurance company would take the land out of the new home purchase out of the equation. So for example, if you had a million dollar home uh, replacement cost amount, and you went out and purchased a home for a million dollars, they would take out the land value out of that and it wouldn't be part of the qualification. Uh, so what this new legislation has done, it's eliminated that the insurance companies are no longer allowed to take the new land value out of the equation. So if you spend a million dollars on replacing your home somewhere, they can't deduct anything for the land that you're buying at the new home. So essentially you still own the land that you're old location and you can use all of your replacement cost money even if a lot of it's towards the land value and you still get the benefit of that so think about the financial That's windfall big. yeah it's, it's 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 huge i don't think it's necessarily that fair to the insurance companies candidly uh but there are some reasons why it makes sense and 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 so that's to me that's just a, a really big change you know what the reality is just knowing that somebody can actually take the proceeds from their house that got destroyed and just go buy another home is significant. Because I know people that were up in the, um, was it in uh, uh, Northern California that had their um, houses um, burned down and they waited months, if not years, to have that place re rebuilt and they were renting the whole shot. And the reality is they would have loved to just buy another house and move on. And now, you know, and the other part is if you think about the land portion of the house, that might be 30% of the value. It could be even more depending on where you live. So, right. you know, and sit here, hey, I'm buying a million dollar house, but I only have $600,000 to put down if I own the whole thing because I still own this burnt out land that's worth 400. <laughs> so you have to sell it in order, you know, so now you can just kind of go, okay, that's yours insurance company. Goodbye. I'm, I'm good to go and I can move on. That's, that's gigantic. No, well, you, you, they don't get your land from your old place. You still have your land from your old place. Oh, wow. So you can they don't get that. Oh. So that's why I'm saying that's like can be kind of a windfall because you still own that lot. And granted, right after a fire comes through, that lot might not be as valuable as it, as it was prior to a, a, a brush fire coming in, say. Mm -hmm. But it will be. You know, it will come. The land will come back and it has value. And you still own that, that you don't give that up by buying the new house and the new land. Oh, wow, that, that it is not good for the insurance company, but it's great for <laughs> <No>. the insured. <laughs> exactly. I can see exactly. some loss ratios jumping up with that. And I can, well, only in yeah. the areas where the fires are that have devastated a number of homes, I can see the rates going up from that. But- And, um, and, that, and that's a good point. The, a lot of these new laws are only if it's a declared disaster. So if it's just a one-off or five houses burned down, or even an example of Orange County, I think it was 20 houses burned down, I think if I remember right, the, the number is 25 homes in order for it to be a qualified event. 
So that a lot of this new regulation is really geared towards big disasters. It's not geared towards, you know, a couple of houses burning down. So when you're looking at 50, 60, 70 homes, but, uh, um, like uh, last year in uh, Colorado and places like yeah. that. Uh, okay, so that's that's good to know. But the reality is when the whole thing's devastating, it could be years before you can rebuild your house just because of contractors and all that stuff. You can take that money and go somewhere else. That's wonderful. Yeah, now that's, these are, most of these new regulations, by the way, Steve, are California regs. So mm -hmm. Colorado, although they've adopted some uh, some regulations, not they're not quite as advanced as California has gotten. They'll probably follow suit, uh, but most of the other Western Western U.S. Uh, states haven't adopted quite as comprehensive a consumer rights uh, regulations yet. So a lot of what we're talking about today is really geared towards California, mm -hmm. although the ability to buy another place instead of build that remains true everywhere. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay. Hey, you know what? We're going to have to take a break. Um, please stick with us. We got more Steve Severade, the Greenspan Company, Adjusters International. This is something you're all going to want to hear. So stick with us. We're going to be right back. Hey, Cameron, we just finished segment one with Steve. Uh, we're going to start segment two. And um, here we go. Five, four, three, two, stop, reset. There we go. Hey, welcome back to the Saving with Steve show, where we talk about the ins and outs of money. You know what? I want to take a moment and thank our affiliates at UK Health Radio, BBS Radio, AMFM247 for distributing our show. And you know what? If you're looking to get guest gifts, you can always go to Saving with Steve Sexton for you know guest gifts, behind the scenes stuff. Um, you know, if you want to see the shows, you can go to Spotify, Google Play, and so on. Again, we're all about helping you solve problems uh, and live a, a life of financial and personal freedom. So we're here back with Steve Severade. We're talking about wildfires. We're talking about public adjusting and claims. You know, one of the biggest things that people don't understand how to do, because we talked about it a little bit, but not really this question, is how does somebody prepare for dealing with an insurance claim? Because most people just don't know because it might be 20 years with a policy and then all of a sudden something happens and they're like, okay, what do I do now? Yeah, so one thing that I always uh, suggest to people and, they, and I get this question a lot, as you can imagine, uh, you know, first of all, the receipt thing doesn't really help too much. Even if you have receipts for things, you put them in a safety deposit box, you could do that. Uh, a lot of times people buy things on sale or they bought something five years ago and the prices go up. So sometimes having a receipt for something in your house doesn't always help you. It could actually work against you by turning that receipt in. But what will help you is doing a, a, a video recording of your home. And what I mean by that is you take your phone or take a video camera and walk through your home and narrate as you walk through and open drawers to dressers, kitchen cabinets, and, and talk about into the recording, talk about what you see and what's through your home. This gives us uh, post loss, it gives us such an enormous tool to help recreate everything that was in the house. Just that 15 minutes uh, or 10 minutes of walking through a home, we learn so much. We're not just learning about the contents, by the way, when you're doing that walkthrough, we're learning about the structural components of the home too, because we're gonna see the kitchen cabinets in the background, just as I see your cabinets behind you, I might be looking for the picture frames I see in the microphone, but I'm also seeing the cabinets. So the same thing goes for a video when you're walking through. We get to learn a lot about the fit and finish of the home and we get to learn about what was in the sock drawer and all that kind of stuff. And when we're putting an inventory together, Steve, it's incredibly comprehensive down, down to pencils and paper clips. So being able to have a visual of that stuff, even if it's just a sweeping visual, it helps a tremendous amount. Very important though, that video needs to not be in the house. <laughs> Right. It needs to be in the cloud or it needs to be off site somewhere because you could do this terrific video and and then it could be sitting there and burned down and we're, we're not better off. For it. Safety deposit box. Um, and I you know what you've heard this before, but being somebody that used to work for AAA, um, I, I, I know of two or three of those stories where they did the video and all that stuff. And I, I see the picture of the melted video camera that had the tape in there. <laughs> and and I will say this. You know what, um, people who have done that, um, they have saved themselves a lot of heartache. They've actually received 
uh, especially when they're replacing things at cost, uh, uh, today's cost, not 10 years ago cost. Um, the, 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 it's been significant, especially with items like uh, cutlery that have melted. Um, you know, somebody walks in and say, this is a piece of back rack crystal. It's a, we have three of them. They're worth this and they can go and price them. And the whole shot yeah. makes a big difference. Now, um, <clears throat> why, uh, the next question is why property owners might need to reconsider their property coverage. Why should people reconsider, you know, what their, their coverage that they currently have? Um, is it because they could be under, under covered or under um, they're under the limits or um, over their limits from the value? Uh, how does that work? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. There are a number of reasons why you might want to dust off your policy and reevaluate it. We, we have a lot of people say, well, this is what the broker recommended. And then we look at it knowing the world that we live in now and costs and a lot of the insurance carrier agency calculators are off. So just because your agent recommends a limit to you doesn't make it the right limit. Do, do a, talk to a few local contractors, figure out what the price per foot is and then double check that against your coverage because we see under insurance a lot, a lot more than I'd like to see it. And you know, if you're in a situation where you have a devastating fire, that's not the time to find out that you didn't carry enough insurance, right? Mm -hmm. You, you wanna know that ahead of time. And you know, the premium dollars to, to raise your coverage a little bit. I've even had people who I know who've gotten in arguments with the agent when they want more coverage than the agent thinks they should have. Uh, and so it's, it's pretty interesting, but get a, get a feel for what it would cost prefer if you're, and then, do that math on your on your policy and make sure you have enough. Also, if you bought your home a number of years ago, you might have uh, an inf there's an inflation guard protection clause built into a lot of insurance policies, which means that the, the policy limit goes up a little each year. And if you ask your agent, the agent might say, well, don't worry about it because you have an inflation guard protection, so it's going up a little a year. That usually doesn't keep up with what the real rise in costs are. Mm -hmm. And so if you've had a policy for 10 or 20 years, you're, at a, you're at an artificially low base that's been artificially raised in two smaller increments. So you mm -hmm. could be really behind the game. Well, you know what, I, I, I want to point out something here. Um, you know, you already know that I used to work for AAA. My wife used to teach the insurance, but um, we were reviewing one of our clients coverage and that inflation guard was only 2%. So if you right. think that over the last 10 years, it's 1% short. And if you look at the last couple of years, it's almost five and 8% short just because of where inflation is now. On top of that, their house, you know what? The cost of the wires, the thickness of the wires, the four by four, uh, the two by fours are now four by four. So there's a different cost there. So yeah, it's vastly different. And if you don't have, uh, you know, that replacement cost there, you could be in trouble with your coverage. Um, you could you know, they might have to put your house together with substandard materials to get it, you know, get the same house unless you're going to come out of pocket. The other right? thing I want, to, yeah, that's right. And the other thing I want to add, and I think I might have touched on this the last time you and I were together, is that there's there's a there's a part of the policy that I know you know about, but maybe your your uh, listeners don't, and it's called extended replacement cost, and that's a, a percentage above the policy limit that kicks in if you need more coverage. And there are a lot of agents that will say, well, don't worry about your policy limit because you have a 20% or a 50% or whatever the percentage is, uh, extra money above and beyond that policy limit if you should need it in a fire or some kind of loss. And that's not the intention of extended replacement cost. It's not to put the numbers together to come up with a number. That is for crazy things that you couldn't anticipate, like what we've seen lately with supply shortages, with, uh, in, with lack of, of labor, uh, with increased material costs. All these things are those, uh, oops, we didn't count on these things. So you wanna make sure you have an oops, we didn't count on these things category. You don't wanna be using the oops part of the coverage as part of your, in thinking about what you need for coverage. Mm -hmm. I agree, I totally agree. Because the last thing you want is you, you don't want to say, pardon the French, oh, crap, and you find out you're short. So yeah. now, um, what are the biggest pitfalls homeowners should avoid when filing claims after a property loss? Uh, well, it depends on the claims, but I, I will tell you, sometimes people are, are timid about making a claim 
or they don't want to ask for everything because they're worried about their insurance policy to their insurance company. And I would say, and you know, from your background at AAA, if you have a, a, ma a major claim, whether you have a claim that's 20,000 this way or 20,000 that way, underwriting is going to make a decision whether you're, whether you're there or not. And the law of large numbers is going to play into all this. So if you have a claim, ask for everything you're entitled to. Don't shortchange yourself because you're thinking about the relationship and, and the renewal of premium because they're not going to take into account that you were a nice guy and didn't ask for everything. And so we'll just keep covering. It doesn't work that way. That's it's mm -hmm. done by a completely different department, right? Yeah. Hey, I just want to add to that. I, 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 you know what? Most people don't realize this, but insurance companies are big companies. They all have to follow rules and regulations. Everything's based off large numbers and actuaries and stuff like that. So whether, like, like Steve said, whether you are nice or not, the same thing's going to happen. So if you don't ask, you won't receive. Uh, and the important thing is to ask. And sometimes you need an advocate to, to help you ask the right things. So that's why you need people like Steve. Now, are all insurance companies created equal? Um, and I already know the answer to the next one, uh, but uh, should cost be the primary consideration? <laughs> Well, of course, it shouldn't be the primary consideration. Also, uh, we have to realize that people have budgets and, and some people have uh, an ability to, to buy a policy that, that maybe is a higher line or, or more comprehensive. And, but you have to make, you should be making this decision with your eyes wide open. Don't just run out. There's, there's some kind of, I don't want to, I'm not going to hammer over anybody or, or say any references of, of companies that I think are bad. But I will say that there, there are startups and things that think they have a new way of doing insurance and they're real cheap. Uh, you have you know, sometimes warehouse places that will provide insurance and it's cheaper, it's not necessarily better. And sometimes the reasons that agents will come in and price will, will come up with a, a policy amount is because they know that the less amount that they quote, the cheaper it looks. And if you're comparing price, you're not looking at what the coverages are necessarily. You're comparing this company to this company and this one's cheaper. And I only have this because I have a mortgage and I'm forced to get it. So I want the cheapest thing I can get. And, and people think like that, but they're not thinking about, and I can tell you anybody who's lost their home in a fire doesn't think that way anymore. <laughs> they, Never. they realize that this is a product that actually has a use and a need and, and people do use it, need it. And, and so, yes, cost is a factor depending on your situation, but you're better off spending a few more dollars up front and know that you're way better protected later. And the, and the reality is many cases, people can spend an extra 50 to $100 a year, which is not that much. And it can make all the difference in the world when you have a claim. Absolutely. So Steve, I wanna thank you for being here because I know we're in extreme fire season. There's probably other things that are going to happen with tsunamis and earthquakes and all that stuff. And people are going to need, people, you know, companies like yours, Greenspan Company, Industrious International to help them because they just don't know and they need somebody to advocate for them. And that's why you're here. So could you do us a favor? Could you just provide the inf contact information for your company if that's okay? So if somebody needs your help, they can get a hold of you. Sure, of course. Uh, so our, our, uh, we can be found on the web at greenspanai.com. Uh, and we can be reached at 800-248-3888. And uh, we are happy if people have questions, they're not sure how they're, what they're doing, they don't know if they need an advocate, we're happy to talk that through, give them some education, because it, really it's all about education. I think that's what you stand for and what you do with these 80, now 80 podcasts, Steve, and, and we're a real proponent of educating the public as well. And, and so that's what we're here to do. Steve, again, I want to thank you for sharing your knowledge with us because it's invaluable, especially this time of year. Um, and um, you know what? I encourage people to go listen to this, um, this recording. It's going to show a bunch of times around the United States and around the world. So I think a lot of people will be educated. So again, thank you so much. Uh, and you know what? I have a feeling every time wildfires hit, we'll probably have you back. <laughs> so <laughs> We'll become good friends. <laughs> yeah, we will. Well, look, you have a great day. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Next week, we have Alan Nevin. Alan Nevin's a, an economist, a well-known economist with real estate. He's going to discuss 
what's happened with the economy in 2021, 2022, what we can look forward to the rest of 2022 and looking to 2023, which would be very, very important. So with that, I want to thank you all for joining us. You guys have a wonderful week. Stay safe, stay healthy. We'll see you this time next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. We'll see you. All right. Bye.